I'm happy to be here and be partake in this this uh, conference. And so we're gonna talk about wealth DNA. And Chris, if you look to the, the, the first slide. So Queen, who was uh, was here, Arlene, she spoke about my story. So this is like my little snapshot of who I am and who I've become. Um, I say survivor because I survived poverty, I survived welfare, I survived abuse in my household, I survived two parents that were addicted to drugs, cocaine, crack, and heroin. Um, I survived two and a half years in prison. Rikers Island, C-74, Mod 3 Upper. I still with my inmate number in New York, 99R-1288. I survived time in jail in Maryland and two drug trafficking charges by the time I was 22 years old. And so all by God's grace, wasn't anything God did special. Um, so I survived all this uh, to become a celebrity realtor, they called me, um, or realtist, real estate agent, um, that where I have interacted and advised and consulted with many celebrity clients, such as Angela E. Senior from The Breakfast Club, um, and many athletes and that I've, I've worked with, and, and others have influenced throughout the country. I was just a, part, a small part of my brand. Um, so we're going to help them, let them get kind of focused on that cool. And so during my journey and all my success, um, I decided to use my story not just for my own purpose or my success. Oh, even better. Great. Thank you. This is good. Oh, practice. Okay, we're good. All right. So I decided to use my, start, my, my story, my testimony to empower others and became a role model to literally tens of thousands, and I like to even say hundreds of thousands of youth throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, established a national brand for myself in a millennial space, especially in the minority space, of where I'm a very recognizable figure for our youth and middle generation in regards to real estate, leveraging who I was and who I've become. Um, and that gave me an awakening as a community leader where I've done a lot of activism, a lot of protests. I was very influential in the Baltimore uprising uh, when the Freddie Gray incident happened and uh, got a chance to debate Judge Janine on Fox News and got the chance to, you know, Wolf Blitzer, Shelly, Anderson Cooper, and a bunch of other people, just standing up for what I believe are common sense rights for our community. Um, and also, I've been an author as well. I have a few different books, uh, Hip Hop to Home Owners, Lord of My Land coming out, Real Estate A through Z, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've created, in my 35 years now, um, three multi-million dollar businesses uh, for myself, for my investment company, to our educational platforms, on um, some other uh, ventures that we are a part of. So safe to say I've had some success um, in an interesting journey, it's been a long ride. Um, but during this ride, I realized, and it dawned on me when I was working as the first African-American male hired by Southern Beast International Realty, <coughs> their prominent property branch in Bourbon County, New Jersey. And this was in 2011. And I got a chance to work in Alpine, New Jersey, which at that time was the richest town in America. Alpine was the richest zip code in the United States of America. And I got a chance to work there and be a real estate agent in Alpine as a three-time felon, once high school dropped out with no college education. Here I was in America's richest town selling real estate. <laughs> Amazing, interesting. And so during that process, coming from where I grew up on welfare and in the old-fashioned food stamps, where those are the really paper food stamps, you know what right. <laughs> You look at everybody laughing, like, hey, I know yeah. Those. <laughs> so growing up from, from, from my experiences in that environment, right, like cornflakes and water and, you know, mm. toast with syrup on it, they call it pancake specialty. <laughs> so growing up from where I come from, and then getting a chance to go to Alpine, New Jersey, where they're building $56 million homes and $20 million homes and the taxes on one of the properties was 250,000 a year. Taxes. I got to see that there's a whole level of people out here living a way different way than what I grew up, in a whole different way than the schools in Newark and Brooklyn and Philly that I go to and teach these inner city youth. There's a whole other world out there that my community, many of my community, don't even get privy to, aren't even aware of. And so it really sparked something in me and said, well, you know, what are the people here in this affluent area? What are they doing different or what do they know different than the rest of us? Like, what is it that they got that we don't have? What information, what habits, what practices do they have that we don't have? And so all that, um, as I reflected on it, all started to build my, uh, 
I guess, economic activism and my solutions, right? I'm not a problem, I'm not here, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of stats and tell all the problems we have. I'm very solution-oriented, very solution-driven. That's how I got to where I got to, always trying to figure it out. So I see that there's a big problem called the wealth gap, where we know that the wealth gap between you know, uh, African-American households and white households has tripled in the last 25 years. And the home ownership rate in our community has been the same from 1976 to 2012. And that the typical median income of a white household is a little over $91,000. And a typical median income of a black household is a little over $6,000. So think about that. The typical median income of a European American or white household is a little over $91,000. And a typical median family wealth of a black household, African American household is $6,000. Six thousand compared to ninety-one thousand. You say There's six. Or six, not six, not D, six <laughs> thousand. So there's obviously a huge disparity, and so I want to tackle that disparity, right? So what I realized was there were some things differently that my rich friends and rich clients did, ways they lived, habits they had, that were different than that of people I grew up around, how I grew up, and the habits I formed growing up, that my mom had, that my grandma had, that my aunts had, that many that I know had. And so we're gonna to cover today the definition of wealth, symptoms of wealth DNA, versus poor DNA. We're gonna learn the three wealth DNA traits, and then we're gonna actually talk about how you guys activate your wealth DNA. And so when you read your description today, many of you have seen it said, the Realtors Retirement Plan. And there's a few of you thinking, like, what the heck is this got to do with my retirement? It has everything to do with your retirement because how you think is going to be how you actually act. And so the problem in which why we, as real estate agents, many of us, don't have a true retirement plan is because we're not planning for our family legacy. We're not planning for wealth. We're just trying to get a check. And so you find yourself going from deal to deal, closing to closing, getting check to check, but you never actually set yourself up for true, long-standing family wealth. See, 401ks and pension plans is not how the wealthy got wealthy. It's not it. You'll never do it. Parking your money, putting a piece of your check into a, some account, some pension account, getting you 4 or 5% interest is not going to get you wealthy. If you had $100,000 in an account getting you 5% interest every year, you're simply making $5,000 on $100,000 a year. You're not gonna retire off that. You're not gonna get wealthy off of that. So I'm not gonna come here and hand you a bunch of, of sheets and papers and tell you, hey, I got this plan and you put 10% of your check in every time, you're gonna be able to coast off into the sunset. That's not how it works. But if we adopt some disciplines and live by some non-negotiables and learn some areas of expertise as a people, we then can set ourselves up for true retirement and true financial sustainability from a family aspect. So let's talk about the definition of wealth. Wealth as I define it is when an individual or family has an abundance of appreciating or income producing assets that supersede their living expenses, debts, and liabilities. Meaning that when everything you have on value supersedes all the things you have that don't have value, it costs your money, your debt, your liabilities. And in abundance, that's all it is. Wealth is about having an abundance of assets versus your liabilities and your debts. So in order for us to actually have wealth, we got to have what? Assets. We got to have what? Assets. 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 In order to have wealth, we got to have what? Assets. No, I need everybody to say, not four of y'all. Assets. Assets. In order to have wealth, we have to have what? Assets. Yes. Income producing assets. That's how we get what's called family wealth. When you look at the definition of wealth, you'll typically always hear about it in terms of family, not even individual wealth. 
But family will. You watch the Super Bowl or the World Series, and a team wins, and they come with the trophy to the owner. They never actually just say this is for John Roberts. This is for Jerry Kraft or Robert Kraft. They say this is for the Kraft family. This is for the Jones family. Because those teams, those major assets, are part of their family wealth. I was watching the show Undercover Boss, and it was uh, one of the, the uh, songs from the Chicago Cubs. He was, uh, you know, undercover as a janitor and selling popcorn for the Chicago Cubs baseball team. But he's one of the owners, right? Young guy. His dad, and in the beginning, he said, My dad bought this asset for our family three years ago. Mm. It's not a team to them. Mm. Not buying a team for a team. A team's an asset. Until we get asset driven, we'll never ever be able to bridge that wealth gap. It's simply about eliminating our liabilities or decreasing our liabilities and increasing our assets. That's how we become wealthy, it's very simple. And so we're gonna talk about ways in which we do that. So I'm gonna go some quick symptoms of wealth DNA versus poor DNA. And see, when I say DNA, we're talking about it, wealth DNA is wealth disciplines, wealth non-negotiables, and wealth areas of expertise. The D in DNA is wealth disciplines. The N is wealth non-negotiables. And the A is wealth areas of expertise. This is what we have to activate within us. I believe everyone has the wealth gene, just not everyone has activated the wealth gene. Yes, wealth disciplines, right? It's gonna be the first, the D. And that is the disciplined lifestyle and habits the wealthy have. Wealth disciplines. But how are they disciplined as opposed to people that have poor DNA or have not activated their wealth DNA? And then there's wealth non-negotiables. What is a non-negotiable lifestyle that the wealthy live that we all don't live or that you grow under? That's the end. And then there's the A, wealth areas of expertise. What areas of expertise do the wealthy know that we don't know or we don't adopt? Mm. That's the core wealth DNA. This is how we activate our wealth DNA and become a new us. It's what I've learned. I didn't know about wealth DNA five and six and seven years ago, but when I left the streets, I left, I left, I left the corners of Newark, New Jersey, 10th and Springfield, one day selling dope, one morning. And I had bloods and crates hustling for me. And I'm 20, I'm, I was 24 actually, approaching 25. And I reflected at 5.30 in the morning on my life and realized that I was 25 years old, I had no college education, I had nothing my mom could be proud of, nothing my seven-year-old daughter could be proud of, other than a little bit of jewelry and cars and some, some party life. And I had three felonies in three different states, and I still was selling drugs. And I had to ask myself, is this all you're gonna be in your life? Like, this is who you become, Jay? And I said, are you a hustler or are you a drug dealer? Because see, a drug dealer can only sell drugs. A hustler can hustle anything. So I challenged myself to say, Jay, if you're truly a hustler, and you're truly this charismatic, bright, strategic thinking guy that you think that you are, then why can you only sell drugs? Why are you even stuck in this lifestyle since the time you're 15? And so that day in North New Jersey, I made a, an epiphany. I just simply said, you know what? I'm gonna quit. Today's my last day on the job. I still had drugs left. And most people said I'm gonna finish first and mm -hmm. I'll get back to it later. I had a conviction over me that day that I was done with selling drugs. I didn't like the company I was keeping. I, I pictured where I would be when I was 30. And all I could picture was, you know what? Dead or Jim. All I could picture. So I tried to re-picture it. I tried to reimagine it. Like, no, 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 no. I tried to picture it again. And I still could only literally picture myself in a tan suit behind bars or on the ground next to a curb with my head bleeding. That was my actual image I had of myself at 24 or 25 of where I would be when I'm 30. I couldn't see any way out. 